Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the second in the Northwest Extends A in B Farming and the Environment Spring Webinar Programme. Just a couple of bits of housekeeping before we kick off. The chat function will be disabled um, during this event, but the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen is open the whole time. And you're very welcome to type in your questions and answers as we go along. Um, if you just type in your question, we will then field that um, to our speaker. Or if you'd like to make a point or engage in discussion direct, please type talk in front of your question or point, and we will invite you to unmute yourself. We won't be able to see you, I'm afraid, but we will be able to hear you speak. So I'm very pleased today to welcome Paul Silcock, who is founder and managing director of Cumulus Consultants. Paul is a rural practice chartered surveyor, chartered environmentalist, and an applied agricultural and environmental economist. He has 30 years experience in agricultural, fisheries, rural, environmental, and economic consultancy, and an in-depth knowledge of the land-based sector and natural capital. Paul has managed more than 200 projects across the UK and abroad for clients in the private, public and voluntary sectors. Paul's presentation is going to introduce to us the concept of natural capital. He'll share his extensive knowledge and experience of working with the land-based sector and applying a natural capital approach, both in policy and practice, and what this could mean for your farm. He's going to explain how a natural capital approach can lead to more informed decision making, enhanced environmental and economic performance, greater resilience, improved regulatory compliance, and enhancing public profile and support, including for the new environmental land management scheme and private environmental income schemes. Just before you start, Paul, I should mention that the uh, webinar is going to be recorded and you will all receive a link after the event to the recording. So welcome Paul and over to you. Sorry about that. Hi everyone. Um, I, uh, I can't see you all but I, I recognize a few names on the attendance list so um, hello to everyone and um, um, thank you very much for the introduction, Henry. I'm going to uh, get on and start the presentation now. So if you hang on just a second. I can find it, that is. Just hang on a second. Okay, um, sorry about that, here we go. So hopefully you should, should be, all be able to see that okay. Um, so uh, natural capital uh, on your farm. Um, my background is uh, working in the farm and environment sector. I've been doing that, as uh, Henry said, for the past uh, 30 years or so, at uh, both uh, practical and policy levels. Um, and in the past 10 years or so, we've been working on uh, applying uh, ecosystem services and natural capital, uh, terms which I'll explain in a minute, uh, to the to farming and land management, um, both for uh, government, including DEFRA, Scottish Government, Natural England, uh, we've been working in Jersey, other AOMBs and national parks, um, uh, as well as uh, NGOs and uh, in the private sector. Um, Back in 2017, we got engaged by the Crown Estate Scotland and partners to look at the uh, something called the Natural Capital Protocol, which is their kind of a, a global initiative focused on uh, natural capital, as its name suggests. And um, we were undertaking the first trial of its kind of applying the protocol to the land-based sector. We work with four uh, different uh, land-based businesses um, in, in, in different sectors. 
And since then, uh, we've been developing an approach that's very much focused on uh, landowners and farmers uh, to apply a natural capital approach to their businesses and inform long-term strategy. Um, we are rolling out uh, these assessments, uh, working with farms and estates around the country, uh, working with uh, in investment portfolios, including the church commissioners, um, helping to uh, deploy and develop um, ELM and existing and emerging environmental markets and exploring opportunities for um, external investment into uh, natural capital as well. So that's a little bit uh, by way of background. Um, I worked in, in uh, the uh, North West East Downs area for about five years with Corinna uh, many years ago. Um, so this presentation uh, is gonna cover off uh, what is natural capital, um, why is it important? Um, why does it matter to my business, as in your business? What could I be doing um, if, I, if I'm inclined to do that? Uh, and what would be the benefits? And that will hopefully then lead us up for, uh, as Henry said, uh, a few questions and answers, uh, which I'll do my best to answer. But if we can't answer them today, obviously feel free to, to, to get in touch afterwards. So this slide, uh, what is natural capital, um, summarizes thinking behind uh, natural capital and its uh, relevance to farms and estates. The natural capital or natural capital assets are those are the things listed there. So soils, arable and grassland, woodland, heathland, uh, water, uh, including groundwater, rivers and streams. They're the stock of renewable and non-renewable natural resources that together yield a flow of benefits to people. Uh, ecosystem services, as opposed to being the stock, ecosystem services are, are, is a flow of services, a bit like the difference between capital and revenue on a balance or, or, or in a set of accounts. So ecosystem services are the flow of those services that are produced by those natural capital assets, which together with other capital inputs lead to goods and services which are of benefit to and valued by people. So that includes food, energy, clean air, water, and regulation of risks and recreation and spiritual benefits. It's important to bear in mind that while we're focused on natural capital, clearly the uh, production and delivery of those benefits depend on other capital inputs. Uh, the skills, knowledge and experience of people, uh, the financial capital underpinning farm and other land-based businesses, the manufacturing capital in terms of you know, buildings, machinery, equipment, et cetera, as well as inputs and out inputs. And the social capital, the networks that you have with local communities, with uh, supply chains, with consumers. These are all important. So whilst there's an awful lot that natural capital can help us with in terms of how we run businesses, it obviously needs to be done in tandem with those other capitals. So this is a summary slide, really just sort of summing that all up. So practically on your farm, your soils, arable land, grassland, whether that be improved, improved or semi-improved or the chalk downland, woodland and water, both groundwater, rivers and streams and the wildlife, they're your assets and they deliver these ecosystem services that are typically divided into these four categories. Those which are provisioning, food, water, timber and fiber, regulating, regulating climate, water quality and flood risk, cultural services, which are opportunities for recreation and tourism and cultural development, and the unseen and but supporting and critical services of nutrient cycling, water cycling, soil formation, biodiversity, etc. So that's a summary. Many of this you will be uh, obviously totally familiar with and have a very good understanding of. You may not be calling them natural capital or ecosystem services, but you will be familiar with them. And I'll come on to what, what the difference is between 
natural capital and ecosystem services. And some of the things that you're already doing, perhaps, we can come on to that in the discussion uh, afterwards. I, I always think of natural capital and ecosystem services as two sides of the same coin. So those of you who've been, who've been involved with this area or interested in this area for some time, back in the day, there was an awful lot of focus on ecosystem services. More recently, there's been a focus on natural capital. So one is the, just a repeat, one is the stock and the other is the flow, the two sides of the same coin, really. So um, consider a, a North Wessex Downs landscape or a state or farm. There are a range of habitats that form your, part of your natural capital assets, ranging from the arable land down there in the bottom of the va valley, the semi-improved grass into chalk downland, and the, the broadleaf woodland and watercourses, and also the things under the ground too, obviously the soil and the groundwater, etc. If healthy, and if there's sufficient quantity as well, these all have potential to provide numerous ecosystem services. Uh, connectivity is important too. So those ecosystem services are there. I won't repeat. I won't read them out, but they're there for you to see uh, uh, on the screen. So why is natural capital important? What's the big deal? Well, management and use of our natural capital assets is important globally and nationally, and it's becoming more important as time goes on. We're familiar with uh, the discussion on, uh, on climate change and biodiversity loss, climate and ecological emergencies, population growth, and changing in political economic landscape. Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, said, improving the quality of life for more people while protecting our fragile and finite natural capital is the defining challenge of our time. And there's a, a close correlation here between natural capital and how natural capital can help us and how a, a, a better understanding of it and an approach that looks after it and enhances it can help us as we tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. Closer to home, we are, I don't need to tell you this, in a, in a moment of big change with the Agriculture Act, uh, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, uh, some of the details of which were published yesterday for the Sustainable Farming Incentive, the Environment Bill, which hasn't quite made it onto the statute, statute books yet, the 25 year environment plan and government's net zero targets. So a lot going on, uh, just pure, purely on the sort of environmental side, let alone anything else relating to uh, farm businesses and trade, etc. So this diagram um, begins to bring it close to home about why natural capital is important to land based businesses. As I mentioned, your business environment is changing. New agricultural policy and, and, and agricultural trade rules, both with the EU and more broadly, they're all changing. Environmental regulation, we've got the clean air strategy coming on, on stream fairly soon, which will consider things such as ammonia. Climate change, obviously mentioned. Pests and diseases, both climate related and other, and similar for animal health. We have emerging uh, existing and developing environmental markets, which I'll touch on a bit later. Uh, public uh, payments for public goods and public demand for public goods, underpinning government policy in this area. Uh, changing consumer demand, and that's particularly the case uh, and has been accelerated by COVID. Uh, and, and obviously things like input prices as well and volatility. And, and one can add to that, uh, a heap of other changes which I'm not going to cover off, including technology, uh, etc. And technology can help us as well in terms of better understanding and monitoring our, our natural capital. So if uh, natural capital is important, what are some and other land-based business doing about it? Well, um, there are a range of public sector bodies that have been working in this area for some time, um, including uh, Forestry England, Forestry Commission, some quasi-public uh, bodies as well. I put that, put um, 
the Duchy of Cornwall in that category and, and maybe Crown Estate Scotland um, and NGOs as well. And there are some leading private sector estates and farms, some of whom may be on the call today. And partnerships as well. And some of these uh, we're working with, others are doing things in their own right, there's a lot going on. Um, our, our focus, I suppose, has very much been how do you convert this very high level thinking, if you like, to uh, an individual farm or estate or indeed a portfolio uh, of, of farms and estates and bring it into bring it down to uh, down to ground, uh, but also have a very a clear business focus and a, a focus on long term strategy. So some questions you might want to be asking yourself if you're if you're interested in this area. So what is the extent and condition of my natural capital assets? You know, what are they? How much, have, how, many, how much have I got? And are they in good condition or not? What is their capability to deliver those range of ecosystem services? And for those ecosystem services, what are my, my enterprise, my farm enterprises and activities? Uh, depend, what are their dependencies and impacts? Now, some of them may be fairly self-evident others less so. Uh, so for example, um, your, your, your crop production uh, enterprises, for example, obviously dependent on soil, etc. You, you'll also be having, um, you may well be substituting dependence on natural capital with inputs from the bag, etc. And some of the things that you're doing may well be having impacts on other ecosystem services which are not directly related to the farm. In other words, some of these ex externalities, I suppose you might call it. And your enterprise activities is not just the core farming enterprises that I'm talking about. So it's non-farming enterprise and activities as well. And also thinking about not just the farm business, but impacts in terms of supply chain and consumers. And what, is it, what about the interrelationship between enterprises? Are there any conflicts or synergies? In other words, one enterprise doing, doing, doing one thing, which may have adverse impacts from a natural capital perspective on another enterprise. It's worthwhile looking at these trade-offs, these potential trade-offs, whether, you know, whether those conflicts at least can be minimized and the synergies enhanced. And what are the natural capital related risks and, and opportunities for my business going forward? So there's some of the questions to think about. Um, so we've been we've been grappling with these issues and thinking about well how can we how can we get an approach that fairly simply applies some of the uh, high level thinking if you like into the farm uh, and estate business context and more than that also uh, takes account of the fact that we are at a moment of of significant change and we all need to be thinking ahead five ten. 15, 20 years ahead in terms of our response to those changes and how we, how we will be running our businesses, if you like, in 10 or 20 years time. So purely from a natural capital perspective, um, we've been, one would look at the natural capital assets. What are the extent and condition? And what are the, the relevant ecosystem services and impacts and dependencies? And then we would start looking at those risks and opportunities. And importantly, we, then we would be pulling out some of the uh, a strategy, some of these strategic principles and an action plan. And that would link into how we monitor our natural capital and how it then links into broader business strategy. Now that broader business strategy is important, linking back to what I said earlier on about those wider capitals. So one may have a, a strategy about improving soil uh, condition, for example. Um, but that also needs to, to, to dovetail into your machinery strategy um, and, and your, 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 the products that you're selling clearly. From a, from a state perspective, there might be land tenure considerations and from any farm business or a state business, we'll be thinking about investments as well. What should I be investing in? Whether that be uh, built infrastructure uh, or, or whether it be investment in different forms of enterprise. So natural capital is one important element, but it's only one element. 
So here are some examples of, of different aspects of the assessment approach. So at the top there, we would look, uh, we, would, it's, it, we would gather data. And there's a lot, a lot of data that is obviously on farm that you'll be familiar with, but there's an awful, also an awful lot of data in public data sets that are often unknown to farmers and landowners. Um, so we would uh, we start with a, a geographic information system uh, data collection exercise, you know, gathering what we can, the relevant data sets. There are, there, are, there are an incredible number of public data sets which are growing all the time. And it's really important to, we would suggest, it's really important for farm and, and other land-based businesses to, to get a handle on these uh, because they can, they can be really informed and really helpful when blended with your own data. So that blend is important. And some of that data, that information is in your head. Some of it written down on, on plans, and as they, some of it's on the web, available through uh, GIS and, and, and other sources. The second bit there in the middle with the, the table is uh, an example of an actual capital asset register. So this is a, a subset. It focuses on, on, on one broad habitat type, enclosed farmland. And within that broad habitat type, we, we down the left-hand side here, we've broken that down into you know, familiar terms that farmer, farmers would understand. So the you know, cropland, permanent improved pasture, unimproved pasture, margins, etc. Hedgerows are really important here, um, you know, particularly when you think about carbon storage and sequestration. We were amazed when we did this particular assessment that and we did a carbon footprint exercise alongside it, that the hedgerows were uh, doing uh, as much carbon sequestration and storage as, as the area, areas of woodland on the farm. Um, so they stack up. And this, this really sets out really the the extent, which I've redacted here for confidentiality reasons, but the extent of the, uh, the different habitat types. And then uh, something about designation, but it's all about condition as well. What's the carbon content, pH, uh, look about nitrogen application, agri-environment and other certification, soil organic matter, farmland biodiversity, etc. These condition indicators are, are somewhat fluid, and we're trying to kind of develop these so that they're relatively simple, relatively fit for purpose. Different folk will have different perspectives on this. Um, and then the impacts and dependencies analysis, looking at the flows between the asset and the end product. You know, what's, what are the externalities or the, uh, the, uh, the positive and negative impacts of that production process? Taking, so, so for example, growing a winter wheat crop from beginning to end. What are the, what, what's happening in terms of those, those uh, impacts? Um, so then we would go on to looking at thinking about natural capital related risks. And these are just an example uh, of a, some different types of risks, some of them biophysical, and some of them a bit more socioeconomic, if you like. You know, so we're familiar with some of this stuff from a climate change perspective, aren't we? Uh, and, 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 and in recent years, you know, limited moisture retention and it, within soils and, and also water availability. Um, both of them going to be more uh, important going forward. Water pollution, um, uh, flooding, uh, loss of semi-natural habitats and species, invasive species as well, and that will be a challenge going forward. Uh, am ammonia emissions, and we can expect for uh, not only pigs and poultry, but we can expect also for um, uh, more intensive dairy farms, and also cereals farms as well, a, a greater focus on, on, on clean air as a clean air strategy is, is implemented. Um, and climate change clearly covers a number of different angles. BPS is on there, it's not a natural capital risk, but it is a risk that does affect natural capital and provides opportunities as well. Uh, not the loss of BPS, but it's replacement clearly. Um, an important one at the bottom there is lack of awareness and recognition of the public goods delivered from farms and estates. And that social uh, and communication aspect is really important going forward. Um, these are, we, there, there's a very long list by the way of potential risks and opportunities. So we're just putting a snapshot of a few of those on the screen. So what about the opportunities? Well, there are, uh, I say a large number of opportunities for help 
to, 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 to enable our natural capital if by enhancing our natural capital in terms of quantity and condition uh, to, to do some of this work for us. So in, clearly uh, improving soil quality by improving soil organic matter uh, is generally uh, well recognized to be beneficial and many are going down uh, this kind of route, uh, applying some of the uh, principles of uh, well promoted through the organic farming uh, approach into more conventional uh, production uh, systems as well. Uh, some, call, some are calling this regenerative uh, farming or regenerative agriculture, and there's quite a lot of different terms about. And there's quite a lot, there's, it's fair to say there's a fair overlap between what we're talking about here and some of those other aspects. And I will just pull out that's you know the elements that th these are all kind of aligned and going in the same direction, but I will pull out you know some of the elements about what is different about a natural capital approach. Uh, so many of you in your farms will be taking this approach um, as part of, for example, things like implementing agri-environment schemes or uh, uh, deploying uh, integrated farm management through LEAF or, or similar. Some of you will be uh, involved with, with regenerative farming. Uh, some will, of you might be thinking about agroecology, another, as another sort of buzzword, if you like, another a concept, there's a strong overlap um, with, with some of those aspects. Um, what I'm talking about is not cutting across those, but is, if you like, encompassing some of those, those different uh, practices and approach, approaches. Better utilization of manures and slurries, and, a, and, and the integration of livestock and uh, cover crops and green, green covers, etc., into into rotation. Uh, Nature-based farm management, covering pests and pollinators. Uh, habitat creation and ecological networks. Well, there's a big push on, uh, on ecological networks um, and uh, that's well worth looking beyond the farm boundary to be uh, speaking to neighboring farmers, speaking to others who are developing those networks. Great opportunities, not only for, uh, not only paid opportunities, if you like, but opportunities for doing the right thing in terms of improving uh, connectivity and the, the extent of different habitats. Climate resilience is a really important one. And it, this is where it, it, it's so important to stress, it's not just an environmental thing. This is a, a, a long-term economic proposition as well. How do we get our farms and estates fit for the future with those climate change challenges? How can, how can going towards low carbon or net zero actually benefit the business? Over and, over and above, you know, kind of uh, restoring you know, uh, credibility from a public perspective. Taking a, a, a low carbon approach can help um, with uh, supply chain relationships, can help with uh, cost reduction, can help with yield maintenance and enhancement as climate changes, etc. ELM, clearly the environmental land management uh, scheme coming on stream, including uh, that element's going to be rolled out in protected landscapes, including North Essex Downs, AMB farming in protection landscapes element that no doubt Corinna and Henry and others will talk about in due course. Private environmental markets, the, the ones already on the table at the moment, biodiversity net gain, and there, there will be some of you no doubt who will have been thinking about this and maybe registering your land with the environment bank or local authorities. And, and woodland carbon credits again, and we can expect something from the carbon side, something from far, on farmland and soil uh, to come. It's there in Australia, it's not in, yet there in the UK at the moment. And opportunities for enhanced engagement with local communities and other stakeholders, certainly regulators. Uh, supply chain is already there in some sectors, particularly the dairy sector, uh, and likely to expand across the uh, other uh, commodity crop sectors and, and, and so on, customers and partners. Um, so the, these are some of the, uh, the other opportunities. Um, alongside um, putting together a natural capital assessment strategy, there are, there are some sort of things that could also be done and people are, are already doing as well. So quantifying and valuing uh, ecosystem services, that can be helpful to demonstrate and prepare for the delivery of environmental services, uh, particularly into the private sector. Um, I say demonstrating, you know, if you're a tenant demonstrating when the, one of our clients, for example, is a tenant of a charitable trust, 
So demonstrating to that landlord the uh, delivery of public goods and services, um, demonstrating to local communities uh, as well can be useful. Uh, carbon footprinting, helping to get yourself uh, understand what your carbon footprint is at the moment as a baseline for then taking action to reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, and, and look at the, the carbon sequestration opportunities as well. A natural capital accounts. There's quite a lot of confusion here between a natural capital account and a natural capital assessment. The, the main thing here is that the accounts focus on establishing, establishing and then uh, in due course monitoring uh, monetary value. Um, our view is that they can be they can be beneficial, but on their own, I would say they've probably got limited value. I, our, our, our view is that it's important to actually understand the practicalities of the, kind of the, the physical uh, uh, things on the ground and also the business opportunities and risks, not just a, uh, not just a, a set of accounts. So it can be something we should be about, as I say, but it's not on its own. Uh, we think that, that there's, there's a need for that uh, uh, proper assessment and long-term strategy. So what about the business benefits? Well, Henry touched on those earlier, the, the, the informed decision-making. Uh, a natural care approach can help with improving economic environmental performance and greater resilience and regulatory compliance um, and enhance public profile and support. We, we've counted up, we did a bit of a brainstorm on this and we counted up about 13 different areas which are in these blue boxes around the, the, the central green area. And I think uh, one or two, I'm not going to read them, th read them out, but one or two things just to mention. Demonstrating leadership right at the top there is a really important thing for people we're working with. Um, often it's a younger generation actually of, of, of landowners or farmers who, who, who want to be doing this. They, they, they get long-term sustainable thinking and they want to show and get on the front foot and show that uh, they are taking a responsible approach and, and uh, to go forward. The demonstrating leadership is really important. At the top left here, we talk about income enhancement and cost reduction. I'm not talking, in these things, I'm not talking about uh, public payments or indeed uh, income from private environmental markets. I'm talking about the core enterprise, the core cereal enterprise or the core uh, you know, sheep or beef enterprise. There are opportunities through a natural capital approach for, for enhancing yield, qu enhancing quality and quantity and, and cost reduction in terms of input use. And they're not to be, they're not to be uh, uh, kind of dismissed lightly. Each sector is different clearly, but they exist. And they will, those kind of nature-based approaches which um, reduce input, input use, et cetera. Uh, I think we can expect to see a lot more of that going forward. Um, so how can a natural capital uh, assessment help? Well, um, apart from those 13 or so benefits I just uh, outlined, just a few things. And, and the boxes on the right there in blue are quotes from some of the farmers uh, that we've worked with doing natural capital work up in Scotland. Uh, so firstly, a natural capital assessment is, is a systematic framework, a systematic approach for looking at um, all the uh, natural environmental resources that underpin the business and looking at the impacts, independences, risks and opportunities in a, in a, in a systematic, systematic and comprehensive way that doesn't just focus on the business, but also considers the third party or societal uh, effects as well. And that's important going forward because obviously business don't, op don't operate in isolation. They may be operating together, whether that be in terms of delivery, or they certainly be operating in terms of the economic, uh, socioeconomic context they work in. Um, it can reveal new insights relating to risks and opportunities. That's for sure. Third point down there is evidence. By formally working through your natural capital, the, uh, the extent and the condition uh, and the uh, looking at the, uh, and, and potentially quantifying and valuing those uh, ecosystem services, those flows, 
that is really good evidence to show to, 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 to monitor going forward to see whether you're making having a positive impact on your or on your nat natural capital balance sheet if you like uh, is it going in the right direction and that's important as I meant one of the comments there on the right is uh, from a tenancy perspective the bottom bottom quote there shows the work you've done on the ground and the value you're leaving behind you could also say it puts you in a better position for the next tenancy when, when the uh, the current one comes to an end and it can help identify priority areas for action and formulate a plan it my view is it's not enough just to do a, a natural capitalism assessment or, 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 or gather data it needs to be converted into into a plan and a, a plan for enhancement uh, as part of the, the, the business strategy. Um, so, some top tips based on our experience, if you like. Firstly, know what you have. This may not mean doing a, a systematic natural capital assessment, but um, you, you already have data you t um, that you, you, you have on the farm. There's a lot more data, I can assure you, out there that you can potentially access or get hold of about your farm and what it is, um, what its uh, natural environmental uh, features are and what it's currently delivering. Um, if you have someone who says, I'm interested in uh, looking at butterflies on, my, on, on the farm, across the farm, or, or, or looking at, uh, um, you know, water quality or something of that kind, I would personally welcome them with open arms uh, and make sure that you get get the data from them uh, that they gather. That is gold dust, that data, particularly at this moment in time, um, as, as we all work out how we're going to move forward, how we prepare for entry into ELM, and how we think about new environmental markets and our relationship with everyone around us. But it's really important, secondly, to understand the big picture. Use data, gather data for sure, but please don't get bogged down in it. Our experience, a lot of natural capital work gets, falls almost at the first hurdle. Uh, and there's so much effort focused on data, and data collation, and data analysis. Um, our view is that you, know, you can skate fairly thinly across the surface, gather the data that's easily found, and, and get the big picture, get the 80% picture if you like. There will always be an opportunity to dig deeper where it really matters at a later date. In other words, you prioritize where you want to gather more data. Prioritize risks and opportunities, that goes without saying, and then make a medium long-term strategy or plan. As I say, we are at a significant moment of change and the, uh, the businesses that um, are on the front foot, and there are a number of those sort of are already already doing this, are already underway, and we just encourage everyone to be thinking about that right now. And just getting on the front foot. Importantly, use any schemes or initiatives, but don't be led by them. That might be slightly controversial, but you can tell from the agricultural transition plan. Um, and lots of other announcements, there is a, a blizzard of initiatives out there linked to the environment. And people say, where do we start? What, you know, what, what do we, how do we find out what's important for us? Uh, our, our view is that you need to kind of almost work from the farm upwards, understand what the farm is about, what its own assets and, and services are. And then once you've got a handle and got a plan, you can look at which incentives and schemes are relevant to fit into that, which can help you along the way to go in the direction that you want to go in rather than being led by uh, different schemes or initiatives. They will be important, but not all of us can do all of them. So uh, to, to mix some metaphors, just avoid having a situation where the tail is wagging the dog, and, but also don't be a rabbit in the headlights. Let's make a plan and move forward, I would suggest. And I think uh, we're broadly on to maybe five minutes over, but that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, there's more information on our website. There's a brochure you can download about what I've just been going through. And obviously the slides will be available to um, uh, through Corinna and Henry. So I'm going to um, 
stop sharing my screen and uh, come back into the round. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. That was all fascinating and really useful stuff. I, I suppose um, an area of outstanding natural beauty is could be described as an area that's particularly rich in a whole range of natural capital. Um, but I think it's also true to say that uh, we don't have as much as we could or we would like. And I think one of the great challenges for the A and B partnership in the next few years is going to be how we work with the natural capital producers, the farmers, the foresters, the other land managers, to enhance that stock to the benefit of the protected landscape, but also to the benefit of those businesses. Now, just to remind everyone, um, the Q&A box at the bottom, you can type in your question. If you'd like to speak, please write speak before, before or talk before your question or point so we can call on you. Um, and we would be interested to hear what people are already doing, perhaps in relation to your soil or regenerative agriculture or your own assessments and what your experience of that has been. Uh, but we do have, we do have one question um, and Corinna and I are going to box and cox on this. So over to you, Corinna. I'm muted. Um, yes, we've got one question from M. Waite. Um, who says, yes, we are in, a, in an approaching time of huge flux in terms of weighing up the comparative worth of a growing pool of a potential incentives, subsidies for promoting on farm biodiversity. So do you think that there is a danger of inability on the part of agents and farmers to choose the best offers of each given, of each, given that this is a growing complexity? Um, simple answer, uh, yes. Um, I think um, even of those who spend of those who spend most of our working lives in this area, um, it's it's pretty challenging to be honest. Um, but I suppose we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't be too sort of um, dismissive of, of of new opportunities. They're they're going to apply for different folk. But I think hopefully I cover that off. I'm not sure when that question came in, but I hope I cover that off. Is um, you knowing Knowing, knowing where you want to head really as a business, knowing what you've got, uh, setting your own course. So, and that will then, then you will sort of narrow things down. So let's take, uh, you recognize that, the, that, that you've got uh, a range of habitats on a farm. <clears throat> There's opportunity for maybe improving connectivity or improving scale, um, or man managing a se semi-natural habitat in a better way maybe to improve its, uh, its worth. Uh, from, a, from an environmental perspective or maybe from a farm perspective more broadly uh, then you will have that will narrow you down saying well you know I'm interested in schemes or initiatives that help me uh, you know create new habitats or, or, or uh, support what I'm doing already they're not going to be hundreds of these I mean we're really looking at coming on stream uh, you know come to our stewardship ELM will come on stream habitat creation there will be opportunities from uh, biodiversity net gain uh, for example, um, and there'll be an overlap with uh, things like some of the carbon schemes. So I think we'll get used to it. Um, government is grappling with these, uh, these overlaps as well. Uh, <clears throat> ELM will be a good starting point, but there will be um, opportunities, specific opportunities for particular bits of land, for things like biodiversity, biodiversity net gain or improving uh, water you know, land adjoining water courses um, and doing things which relate to carbon in terms of habitat creation, for example. Uh, but I, I think the, the short answer in terms of uh, uh, ability is I think that you know, we're all going to need to be uh, better versed on um, how we make sense of these different opportunities. And, I, and I, to be honest, I think government could be doing a much better job at aligning things as well. And as people may know, we're expecting to hear almost imminently more about the Farming and Protected Landscape Scheme, uh, or programme, I should say, it's not a scheme. Uh, and we are hopeful that as part of that, it will be possible for the AUNB to provide um, some advice and guidance, which may be able to help people find their way 
through some of that, particularly where they're in the protected landscape. So they've got the A and B management plan and the landscape character assessment to guide them in some aspects, but not all aspects of natural capital. Paul, we've got a question from Liz Matteson. Um, there are an increasing number of tools available to assess and map natural capital, but do you know, will there be a government advised tool? Um, that's a good question. I, and I, I, the answer is uh, simply no, we don't know whether there will be a government advised tool. Um, what I can say is in the early days of ELM, um, natural capital was talked about a lot and I think natural capital principles certainly underline ELM development. Um, I think there will be a common land management plan and I would anticipate probably in two or three years time we would probably get some sort of web-based system that enables farmers to assess their own natural capital in relatively simple terms. Um, you're right there, there are a lot of uh, tools out there that look at different aspects um, and again I suppose I would say it's probably a bit like those schemes and initiatives use a tool that is it fits the bill really um, and and not all, not it, it, there's no there's, there's probably no single overarching tool that covers the range of stuff from you know what is there through to thinking about what are the market opportunities relating to that or what, how do we best engage with, with, with communities. Um, so short answer, there's a, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, I, I, I would go through um, uh, understanding what you've got, you know, um, and then picking and choosing the tools and the, indeed the data that you think is going to be helpful. Um, yeah, so we, we, we did a, we, we're doing work up in Scotland developing a a tool for the Scottish Government uh, to help land-based businesses uh, assess natural capital. Um, and there's a lot that you can do, individual farmers uh, and land managers can do without, without the need to go to advisors um, uh, and then signposting to the, some of the more specific tools including the, all of the carbon tools etc. Um, so we, we anticipate that that will come in due course, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Nick Down. Um, are there any double funding issues or implications to be aware of when marketing natural capital? Um, these are good questions. Thank, thank you, Nick. Um, when marketing natural capital, I think probably the double funding issues. Um, I don't think so. I, I, well, I think um, when you say marketing, you mean, you mean selling, really, I suppose. Um, government is designing, uh, or government design of schemes um, is, is trying to catalyze private environmental markets. So it's definitely not trying to kind of <clears throat> compete. And I think government direction of travel is trying to actually encourage the private sector to pick up more environmental delivery than it is at the moment. Um, so I think the design, uh, the design of ELM uh, will prevent double funding. What I would say on that issue is that if you are considering a significant uh, habitat creation scheme, make sure that you look at the options the different options available. Um, there will be options through ELM, but there will also be options through biodiversity net gain and through, through some of the carbon schemes as well. And even with, even with public schemes, um, uh, with significant investment, we, we don't quite know what ELM is going to deliver for us. So I think there's, whilst I'm not saying you should hold fire entirely, <clears throat> um, I would say um, with significant change and, uh, and projects um, you might want to kind of hold back a little bit in terms to find out what ELM is going to be uh, 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 providing in terms of incentive. Okay, 
Thanks very much. Uh, we have another question, and we, they're, they're coming thick and fast now. I should say we'll do our best to answer as many as we can, but I'm afraid we may not get to all of them. Uh, so apologies for that. Peter Lemon, who is uh, one of the farmers in one of our larger farmer clusters in the a and um, says we have a group of 28 farmers who are wanting to work together to improve the local chalk streams. Who can we ask to help us coordinate our natural capital? How should we do this and who should we ask to help us? Um, I, I wonder whether you're already working as part of a facilitation group um, or, or whether you've already got someone who's, who's uh, taking that role forward. The group is, does have facilitation fund agreement and it does have a facilitator. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I, I think that that could probably be readily picked up as you begin to prepare for um, either stewardship or ELM delivery. Um, there is some, if your facility, facilitator does not have that, that experience um, on natural capital, then uh, there are others who can help, including ourselves for that matter. But um, you may you ne may want to bring in some specialist uh, input, but I would imagine your facilitator or your advisor could be doing quite a lot of the work uh, in terms of uh, gathering the the data and weighing up some of those risks and prior risks and opportunities. I should add um, that later on in the Q and A, Sally Ann Spence has put an answer to Peter's question, which is please contact the Freshwater Trust because she's working with them on their chalk stream in Ashbury. So thank you very much, Sally Ann Spence, for that. Um, I've got another question from Liz Matheson. Is there information about the tax status of land that enters long-term agreements, for example, biodiversity net gain? Uh, yeah, there is, Liz, but it's not my specialist area. Uh, we have got a guy on our team called Charlie Russ who uh, would be better advised, but I think that there will be there will be issues relating to um, certainly capital taxes and the, the status of that land from an agricultural perspective. But that would apply that applies to more generally, I guess, to environmental land management. But I'd probably be leading up the path if I gave you an answer on that one right now. So, Tom Storr has a question. Um, what are your thoughts on only using carbon calculators, e.g. cool farm tool, versus sampling and calculating the change to carbon stock over time? For example, the Australian Carbon Credit Protocol. Um, Tom, hi. Um, I think when you get into, I think the, 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 the tools are different things really, probably a carbon calculator, a cool farm tool um, or, or the farm carbon uh, cutting toolkit uh, can help you get a, an understanding what your carbon emissions are, carbon sequestration, um, and can help you sort of set a course for kind of going more low carbon. Um, but that may not be sufficient uh, detail, frankly, for uh, going into uh, carbon offsetting and, and, and selling carbon credits and so on. And I think uh, you probably know more about the Australian situation than, than I do, but when you get into uh, tangible deliverables, that will need to be based on real data and uh, that data updated over time, as you, as you suggest. So I think getting a, getting a high level understanding of, of, of baseline, um, I think will be is useful, but you may, may need to get into more detail as you get into this, you know, consideration of sale of credits and so on. Um, just got a, oh, I've just lost it again. Um, we've just got a response, I think, from, sorry, I've lost it. Uh, there, there was a, 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 an answer in response to the question about um, are there any uh, potential government-led um, natural capital tools 
uh, and I think before I lost the <laughs> lost the answer, it was um, DEFRA's or ENI's ecometric tool. I think that was um, Madison again. Yeah, was a suggestion. Have you got any comments on on that, or do you know anything about that? Um, uh, totally honest, my, I personally we haven't used that. It's one of the number of tools available, um, and um, yeah, um, we can uh, I can we can share with you some of the signposts of various different tools. Yeah. Thank you. Right, I think we've dealt with all the questions. Corinna, is there anything else you want to ask or throw in? Probably just got time for one more. Um, yeah, I suppose the question I had was, you know, we talked very much, very positively about adopting um, some of these approaches, but what do you think would happen if I don't adopt these principles? Um, what impact would it be on my farm business? Um. I, I, I honestly don't think doing nothing is actually a, a, a realistic scenario going forward. Um, I think with the with the loss of um, BPS affecting profitability, uh, ELM coming in place, I think that all of us, all farms, land based businesses, will be moving in this direction. The question is how how quickly and, and to what extent they adopt some of these approaches. Really. Um, so, um, as I said before, uh, the you know whether it be agri environment participation or integrated farm management, that'll get get you quite a long way down the line. But those initiatives are, are, are mainly focused on mainly focused on the farm business uh, enterprises themselves. And I think what we're saying is that it's that plus un understanding the role of the farm in the in the broader context. In terms of uh, opportunities and, and risks, um, increasingly I think those farms that have a, a broader perspective um, and develop those relations either with supply chain or, or, or communities, I think will be the ones which are going to be more resilient going forward. Thank you. Thank you everyone who's asked or indeed answered a question it has all been really helpful. I would love to carry on this discussion all afternoon. It would be, I think, more interesting than the next meeting I'm going to. In fact, definitely, but uh, alas, we can't. Um, Paul, I want to thank you very much indeed. That was a wonderful presentation and very ably and expertly answered questions. So thank you. Huge amount for us to chew on in the A and B, never mind anyone else. Um, I also want to thank Anna Trent, um, who's helped us put this event together, Corinna Woodall, who organised the whole programme, and Shepley, the AUNB communications officer, and particularly today, Joe Popkin, who has kindly stepped in from our sister AUNB um, in the Chilterns to help us run this event behind the scenes. So thank you, Joe. Um, we do have a few more of these talks coming up in the next few weeks, and also a webinar being run by the National Association for AUNBs about the latest on countryside stewardship, the introduction to the Farming and Protected Landscape Scheme and ELM. Um, so please do join us for those. You can see them now on the screen and the uh, link to the, that information should be coming up on the chat for you. There it is, as I speak. Thank you, Joe. Um, and we'll also be sending those details to you in the um, email with a recording of today's event. Before you go, please, can I ask you to fill in the poll, the form that will come up as you leave the webinar, because we want to know what you think about it. We want to know how we can improve these events and perhaps um, have ideas for future events. So we'd be very grateful if you could fill that in before you log off. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks to Paul again. Goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye.